So turn to Luke 11. That's where we're going to be this morning. Good to see you, church. Good to be with you. In the, um, there's an app for that file. You guys know there's a file. There's an app for that. You can, instead of going yourself to a special occasion or event, you can go to an app and actually hire someone to go in your place. Did you guys know this? So there was a guy who uh, had a 10-year class reunion coming up. And uh, he was one of those kind of, I don't know if you classify him as a loser in school, but you know what? He was just one of those guys who just didn't have a lot of friends, wasn't popular, and uh, you know, just, he just said, you know what? For my 10-year reunion, I don't want to go. I want to send someone in my place acting to be me. So he went on the app, took his, got his picture. They found an actor who would, in 24-hour time, not only transform to look like this person, but also to know certain things about his high school career, his experiences, junior high. So we're, we're going to call this guy Steven. So Steven sent the actor. And the actor went to this restaurant where the class reunion was happening, and people were like, who are you? And he's like, I'm Steven. And they're like, wow, you've changed. I mean, slim, fit, tatted, full bougie. That's what we're going to, full bougie, right? And so he started working the crowd, and everyone was just like amazed because the success and, the, and the, just the, the appearance, it was just, he stood out. And then all of a sudden, a few people in the crowd started realizing, you're not Stephen. You're, you're not him. And word started spreading in this restaurant that, no, 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 you're not, you're not the guy we knew 10 years ago. And Steve, the real Stephen and the guy who created the app were in a van listening the entire time. And eventually, what Stephen heard in the van broke his heart. And he wanted to go in and reveal the truth. People were saying, I wish the real Stephen was here. It would be so good to see the real Stephen. That people had memories of Stephen. Even though Stephen didn't think of, him, of himself that highly, people wanted the real Stephen. And so the real Stephen turned to the, the creator of the app and said, let's go in. So there he was put on his members-only jacket, because that's what cool people do, right? He went into the restaurant, and people celebrated the real Stephen showing up. Because for him to hear people say that they didn't want some fake actor being someone that they didn't even know, didn't have a relationship with, but that they wanted the real Stephen to show up, that was the point that he said, people love me, not for who I, what I do or what I look like, but for who I am as a person. And the whole place just celebrating, there's crying, and there's tears. Isn't that awesome? Don't you want to be loved like that? Don't you want to be that, that person that has relationships with people? That you can be you? No matter what you look like, no matter what your, your occupation may be, no matter what... You know, you may be a little weird, you may be a little strange, but, but people love you because you're you. Boy, if one place that needs to learn the lesson of accepting people, not for what they do, but for who they are, it's the church. I'm going to tell you right now, I love the church, but I'm going to tell you right now, the worst people are in the church. Can I get an amen from somebody? The worst people. You know why? Because we of all people who need to understand grace and mercy, and compassion, and kindness are the very ones that withhold that when it comes to our treatment of other people. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time to be called out. It is time to be called out and not walk around with this pride and this vanity and this greed that exists where we think we're better than others. Jesus is going to level the playing field this morning. He's been leveling the playing field in my heart. Now it's my opportunity to level the playing field in yours, hopefully. Luke 11, we get to look at this, this, this scene where Jesus tackles the toughest crowd, and that is who? The religious people. Ooh, the Pharisees. Boo. You know, guys, I, I remember this Matt Damon movie. Matt Damon. I'd rather be a fake somebody than a real nobody. 
No, you don't. No, you don't. God today is calling us out. And you know what? Here's what I'm going to add to our, our whole mask controversy today. You guys know about the whole mask. If you guys haven't heard about it, you know, people want you to wear a mask. I'm going to tell you right now, you may celebrate the fact that you don't wear a mask, but let me just tell you, you are wearing a mask. We're calling you out from behind your spiritual mask today. Because people are like, I got a mask on, or I don't got a mask on. No, we have more masks on than we realize. And God is saying, stop being fake. Because here's what we have to understand. We, 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 we are born legalist. But we have to learn to be Pharisees. You're born into an environment that says, how you perform and what you do is the most important part of who you are. And as we grow, we become more and more Pharisaical in our beliefs. And we begin to shift in our thinking, especially in the church when it comes to Christianity. Christianity is not about making better moralists. Christianity is for those that want to celebrate how powerful grace is. Christianity has created environments where we celebrate the more moral you are, the better you are. And I'm going to tell you right now, Christianity has nothing to do with morals. It has to do with grace. This is what we desperately want inside. But yet we believe the lie. And the more we grow in Christ and think that moralism is what it's all about, I'm not saying morals are bad, but I'm saying morals are not the core. Grace is the core. Because legalism holds us in bondage. Legalism continues to perpetuate this fake us. Legalism continues to, to bury the real you. And we, we, don't, we don't want fake somebodies. We want real bodies. The conviction that law-keeping is the ground for our acceptance with God is, is grace-killing thought. That if I only go to church and I pray and I read the Bible and I do this and this and this, and all of a sudden, you know, Christianity becomes this list of do's and don'ts, and if that's your view of faith, no wonder you feel a burden inside and don't tell me you don't. Grace shatters that. The gospel we are liberated to experience, let me just tell you, has its highs and its lows. Would you all agree with that? In faith, in salvation, there is both fall and re, uh, redemption. Amen? There is both crucifixion and resurrection. There's both brokenness and triumph. And how we learn to, to experience both of those things has to do with grace. Christianity is not always up. Sometimes it's down. How do you look upon others when they're down? How do you look upon yourself when you're down? You're going to learn a lot today. I've learned a lot today. So Luke 11 is where we're going to be. Luke 11, and we're going to talk about hypocrisy. The number one objection against why people don't want anything to do with church, don't want to have anything to do with Christ, don't want to have anything to do with the Bible, don't want to have anything to do with God. I'm going to tell you, though, right now, it's, it's more about the church than anything. Because as I've said for years and years and years, there's so many people that have given up on church, but they haven't given up on God. There's that God-shaped vacuum in our, each of our hearts that Blaise Pascal talked about that only God can fill. And if God, according to Ecclesiastes, has said eternity in our hearts, why are we acting more as hindrances and helpers when it comes to people experiencing God's love in Christ? And it has nothing, they, they're so prone, let's just define our terms, hypocrites. What's a hypocrite? A hypocrite is someone who deliberately says they do something, but they do the exact opposite. There's a deliberateness in their deceitfulness. But when you earnestly try to follow God and you mess up and you're willing to own up to it, we're going to call that, that's just being sinners. <laughs> There's a difference between being a hypocrite and being a sinner. The moment I was saved in Christ was the moment God started doing his renovation work in my heart. And I'm going to tell you right now, 35 years, it's still, I'm, I'm still a work in progress. And I heard this week at a conference, this is awesome, uh, Ruth Graham wife of Billy Graham. They're buried right next to each other. You know what it says on her tombstone? Thank you for your patience. Construction is over. 
Can we just all admit that we're all still works in progress? Can we still all admit we're going to make mistakes? Don't you dare lift me or anyone up on a pedestal and think that just because you're a Christian, we've got all of our morals in line. I mean, we may have all our morals in line, but our hearts could be full of ungrace. I'm going to hurt you. You're going to hurt me. Can we just realize that? Can we put it on the table? Can you just look to your neighbor right now and say, you're going to screw me over. I'm going to screw you over, but we're still going to love Jesus together. Amen. Where are we love to say screw you over in church? Yes, we are. <laughs> See, hypocrisy is, is propping up the externals so that your image and your reputation is impressive, but inside you know you're living a lie. That's hypocrisy. Just being a sinner saved by grace is someone who just says, can you extend me a little bit of, of, of wiggle room realizing that I'm trying earnestly to follow Jesus, but I'm going to fall short sometimes. And that's okay. That's okay. Four points we're going to look at. Luke 11 is where we're going to be. And we get, and as a pastor, I get the opportunity to, to revisit some stuff we looked at last week. So there'll be a little overlap. So thank you for allowing me that. Uh, verse 33, Luke 11. So no one after lighting a lamp puts it away in a cellar under a, 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 a basket hides it, but puts it on a lampstand. Why? Because the light needs to illuminate the room. Everyone needs to see the light, right? The lamp of your body is your eye. When your eye is clear, your whole body is full of light. So your eye is not the light, but there's a light that exists, and how clearly you see is going to determine how well you live your life. Jesus says, watch out that your body is, is, is not full of darkness. Watch out that the light in you may not be darkness. Verse 35, if therefore your whole body is full of light with no bark, dark part in it it shall be wholly illumined and when the lamp illumines you with its rest. so amazing teaching and then verse 37 now so when he had spoken a pharisee asked him hey jesus you want to come to my house and have lunch and he went in and reclined at the table and when the pharisee saw it he was surprised that he had not first ceremonially washed before the meal how dare he but the lord said to him now you pharisees clean the outside of the cup and of the platter but inside of you you are full of robbery and wickedness this is how you win friends and influence people right here right <laughs> you foolish ones did he not make you on the outside also the inside as well but give that which is within as charity and then all things will be clean for you. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts today. Four things. Number one, hypocrisy grows in self-enlightened people. Notice back to the eye, the lamp, the light. Verses 33 through 36 says that this world is full of God's light. The problem, though, is with our sight, being spiritually perceptive. But even though people are blind to Jesus, they still think they have a light. There's so many people walking around saying, oh, I know wisdom, and I know the way, and I know the way to God, as, as Mana shared, right? There's people, two billion of them, we call Muslims, who are deceived. They're following a prophet and a set of, of rules in a religion that does not get you eternal life. I'm listening to the radio the other day. The Dalai Lama was on there. I just like saying that, Dalai Lama. He was on there, and you know what his big charge was? Everyone needs to become a vegetarian. That way we can control the climate change that's happening. And then they talked about his reincarnation into someone else's body. And I'm sitting there going, all those may be wonderful things to talk about, but every single one of those topics is damnable. Dalai Lama, I mean, she even addressed him, the interviewer, as his holiness. Let me just tell you, the Dalai Lama does not know the way to eternal life. I'm listening to another interview. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who just died last week, 72-year-old, world-renowned rabbi within Judaism. Died of cancer. Very interesting thinker within the, the, the Jewish community and beyond. 
In an interview a, a few weeks before his death, one of the, the questions that was posed to him was, why does God let bad things happen to good people? Anyone ever wonder about that? Usually it's twofold, right? Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people, and why does God allow good things to happen to bad people? And here's what the, the, the great moral thinker, Rabbi Sachs, said. God does not want us to understand. He said, because if we ever understood, we would be forced to accept that bad things happen to good people, and God does not want us to accept those bad things. He wants us to understand, he wants us not to understand, so that we will fight against the bad and injustice of the world, and that is why there is no answer to that question. God has arranged that we shall never have an answer to it. Well, that doesn't help anyone, does it? Sacks. What it does is it minimizes the most horrific thing that did happen in the world for the greatest good, and that was the death of Jesus Christ upon a cross. See, the moment we sit there and start thinking about this topic of theodicy, and that's what it is. Why does bad happen to good people? We're assuming a lot in that question. That is the number one thing that we all wrestle with inside because we all experience bad things. But God is not some distant deity who is divorced from pain and suffering and trials and difficulty. He enters into it. And he may not explain himself, but he is willing to take it upon himself so that he may prove the greatest substitute for you. So that while he offers you eternal life, that doesn't necessarily come without suffering or difficulty. But what we understand, just like we do when we take a test in school, God wants to know how well he's developed your character into conformity to the image of Jesus Christ. Who loves tests in school? No one, right? But we do it because the teacher needs to see how well you're learning. Hebrews chapter 12, ladies in the Hebrews group, does not the Father discipline those whom he loves? There and go, if we just minimize it and just say it's God doesn't want us to know, we're missing out on valuable lessons, not only about the character of our God, but the plan he has for our lives. And yet there's a lot of people going, the rabbi's so enlightened, the Dalai Lama is so enlightened, you know, the, the, the Quran and Muhammad are so enlightened. Jesus says, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. Because every world system stands opposed to the claims, the person, the work of Jesus Christ. We don't live in a world where there's both and. There's a world that says either or. You can either be self-enlightened or you can be Christ-enlightened. Christ is the lamp. His presence in you is the lamp. And the guidance he gives you are the rays that are emitted from the lamp of who he is. Choice is yours. We don't live in a Eastern mindset that says, oh, it can be all of it. No, if I step out on Alma's school and there's a bus coming, I will either die or live. There's no both. Right? The world has objective moral truth. Is Christ the way? Will he enlighten your heart? Because if you choose the path of self-enlightenment, you will continue to scurry about looking for wisdom to live, and you're going to realize it is all ultimately empty without Jesus. Wow. Sounds pretty exclusive, doesn't it? Don't blame the messenger. Take it up with Christ. <laughs> Number two, hypocrisy grows in self-exalting people. The Pharisee invites Jesus over to lunch. Now, I am not one to pass up a meal, as you guys can tell, right? Yeah, uh, that felt a little too good. All right, so I, you know, I love eating. It's one of my spiritual gifts. Jesus loved eating. How many scenes in the Gospels do we have Jesus eating a meal? And the Pharisee says, hey, you know what? I'd love to have you come over for lunch. Now, how many of you are going to say that the Pharisee actually has pure intentions inviting Jesus over? I'm just curious. The Pharisee's up to something, right? The, the, the Pharisee's up to something. Why did the Pharisee invite Jesus over for lunch? It's not a joke. 
But you look at verse 45, you, you're starting to get a clue. Look at this. And one of the lawyers said to him, so there's more than just the Pharisee. There's Pharisees and there's lawyers. And he's saying, you're insulting us. And then you skip down to verse 53 and 54. And when he left there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to, very, uh, to be very hostile and to question him closely on many subjects, plotting against him to catch him in something he might say. So there is a total agenda. See, Jesus thinks he's going for lunch, but he doesn't realize he's the main entree. <laughs> you ever felt like that at times? Like, oh man, I'm the meal at the table. Like everyone just wants to devour and attack, right? So here's, they invite Jesus over, and I love how Jesus, even though he's God, right? I mean, he, he's going to turn the tables. He's going to turn the tables because they're, think, they're thinking we're going to bring Jesus over and we're going to just grill him. He turns the tables on him. And some of you may think he's rude. Some of you may think he's snarky. What? If the diplomats had been present at this meal, the press relief, release, the media outlets would say this in the papers the next day. The two parties held frank and direct discussions, but no agreement was reached. As if it's just some like, you know, political conversation. No, 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 no. The real headline should be this, that Jesus takes the occasion to condemn his host's religiosity. But we don't want, we don't want to ruffle feathers, right? We don't want to rock the boat. But Jesus does. Because he had no harsher words to say than to those who were part of the religious elite. I think God says the harshest things to us. Those who claim to know God, those who claim to love the scriptures, those who claim to want to live for him. How many times does does, does God say, I need to challenge you. You're, you're focused on the externals, but you're missing out on what's on the inside. What, what would Jesus say if he came to your house for a meal? What would he say to you if he's at your table? Here's, here's what self-exalting people do. They're preoccupied with their, re- their, their reputation and not the spiritual reality within them. Write down that word reputation. The proverb says this. Why are you so concerned about a reputation when there's more at stake when it comes to the core of who you are? Why are you if you're preoccupied with a spiritual reputation at the expense of what is true spiritual reality? you will continue to be discouraged. You will actually prevent grace from happening in your lives. So what do we do to prop up our reputation? We surround ourselves with people that we can look better around. How many, how many of you have actually, don't raise your hands, but how many of you have surrounded yourself with people that you can kind of manipulate and control, and you know what, they just make you look better? Oh, I'm not as bad as that guy. Oh, did you hear what they did? <laughs> Not me. I'm, I'm superior. I'm, I'm better. And we tend to surround ourselves with people, sometimes unknowingly, because it's all about what others think about us. And I love what D.A. Carson said. For all my three friends that follow me on Facebook, I posted this this week. We are lost when human opinion means more to us than God's. We are lost. This Pharisee invited Jesus over so that he may look better. I'm going to tell you, it is always a poor substitute when you busy yourself with religious activity and you haven't yet done the heart work of digging down into who you are as a person before a holy God. I'm I'm thinking of a word, and the word is this, vulnerability. Vulnerability. I was listening to a veteran speak the other day. I'm so thankful for men and women who have served Veterans Day this past week. Raise your hand, veterans here who served. Thank you. Thank you, you guys. Here's what this veteran said coming back from serving. Vulnerability is, is a weakness in war. Right? When you're serving, there is no, you are not to be vulnerable. You're not to show weakness. You're not to show... You're to be strong, you're to be on, you're to be focused. 
And for this person to come back from war and not understand the importance of vulnerability as a human being was damaging to this person's spirit and soul. And the person realized that while there is a war that doesn't permit vulnerability, there exists within all of us a war where we have to be vulnerable. You have to be transparent. There are men and women dying daily because they don't know what it means to, to feel, to be human, to be in touch with their hearts. Right? Men and women who are suffering PTSD and other mental and emotional struggles. And this man has started a foundation where he says, whatever time of day you call and you share your your that men and women are on call if it's three in the morning and just to hear someone say i love you and you're valuable not for what you do not for what's happened to you not for what you've done but simply because you're a human being Stop propping ourselves up against one another and start really understanding what it means to, to, be, to be transparent, to be vulnerable, right? If there's no vulnerability or transparency or openness with others, all you're going to be busy doing is trying to make yourself a better and more moral person. And the more you do that, the less human you become. Hebrews chapter 4. Look at these words. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. I mean, that is, that's deep. Discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart, right? Because that's what God's concerned about, heart work. And no creature, this is where it gets crazy, right? No creature is hidden from God's sight. And all of us are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Since then, we have a great high priest. So now, notice the, the encouragement, right? There's a sense that we're humbled and, and maybe even fearful or scared that the, the eyes of God see us. Not as we put, we put up our facades, but he sees us as we really are. But here's the good news. You, I, have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. And what's the confession? That he is Lord. He sees me. He knows me. He can, he can even dissect the deepest parts about me that I'm fully, totally unaware of. But he loves me. He accepts me. He adopts me. He calls me his. And he is not distant. He's not one who is unable to sympathize but one who has entered in every respect into our lives and has been tempted as we are, but without sin. If anyone should judge, it's him and anyone who doesn't, and, and he who doesn't, that is grace. Let us then draw close with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace and help in our time of need. Boy, Christ chose not to be self-exalted. But he humbled himself and became a bondservant. So that you may be lifted up. You may experience something that this world could never offer you. Your relationships can never offer you. Your jobs can never offer you. And that is when he exalts you. All glory goes to him because it's only an act of grace that has been now enacted on your life. And when you understand grace, you don't think of yourself better than others. You want to lift others up so they understand. You know what? May our consciences be continually offended if it means our biblical convic convictions are ever, ever established in him.
God needs to offend us because we've, we've built false idols. And it's only the word of God that is going to grow and make us into the people that he wants us to be. Point number three, hypocrisy grows in self-righteous people. So the only way you can continue to be better than anybody else is to continue just to embark upon a life of just, I'm going to earn righteousness. I'm going to do righteous things and be a moralist and, and have good behaviors and make sure I look better than you and act better than you and talk better than you and raise kids that are better than your kids and drive cars that are slightly better than your cars. That's not in my situation, but in your situation. Self-righteous people. Notice Verse 38, 39. Everyone is waiting to get their hands washed. <laughs> Except Jesus. I love this. Because you know what? Sometimes I don't wash my hands. Any other one, anyone guilty here? I'm going to tell you right now, this is not about hygiene. This is not about hygiene. This is about ceremony. This is about ceremony and making ceremony the end-all, be-all. Meaning, you have to jump through certain hoops in order to be accepted. And the moment you don't, people look at you with judgment. Now, the ceremony is not necessarily biblical, which is the problem, right? Because if we're talking about scriptural principles, that's one thing. But if we're talking about certain choices and opinions you have that are not rooted in scripture, therein becomes the problem. You're going to love this guy, Yaroslav Pelikin. Polish theologian said this, tradition is the living faith of those now dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of those now living. I worked at a Baptist church for a number of years. I loved the Baptist church, but I hated the traditionalism. You know what traditionalism does? It's, it chokes out the work of the Spirit because you'd rather hold on to all the past successes, all the past victories. Gotta have the singing Christmas tree. Gotta have the Easter pageant. Gotta have all these things, and we will guard those things with our lives because God help us if we do something new. And I had this verse, this quote, above the door of my office. I had no visitors from the church in my office. I wonder why, because probably every time they saw it, they're like, ah, you know, like. When it becomes something that's not clearly biblical, but yet you're going to guard it with your life, that's self-righteousness. Jesus didn't wash. So now he's judged, not just by this Pharisee, but everyone that had gathered. And let me just tell you about the washing. <laughs> oh, they had a rule book for how you wash. Literally, there was a container of hand washing water that was only used for hand washing. And then they took the amount, here's the amount, an egg and a half shell, egg shell, one and a half eggshells worth of water. You turn your fingers up and someone would pour the water, one and a half eggshells worth, over your hands. But the problem is, the impurities that you had picked up by living in a sinful environment, coming in contact with dirty people, well, it obviously wouldn't leave your body, right? It would trickle down. So then step two is you turn your hands down so then all the water would run off and you'd be ceremonially clean. Jesus is like, I'm not having any of that. I'm sitting down, I'm hungry. I'm hungry for debate. I'm hungry to speak to your hearts, right? And the Pharisee doesn't say anything to Jesus, but Jesus knows what's going on in his heart. Just because you don't say it, God doesn't know about it. Jesus knows what's going on in this guy's heart, and he says, oh, you guys are nothing but robbers, what is it, and wicked. There's nothing going on in your hearts. Well, welcome to the meal, Jesus. <laughs> and yet he condemns everyone in the room. And he says, you think cleaning the outside of the cup and leaving the inside dirty is, is acceptable? You think cleaning the bottom of the plate but leaving the top not clean is acceptable? I mean, how many of you, when you've gone to someone's house for dinner and there's the plate, do you turn it over and look at the bottom? 
No, the other day I walked in seriously into the cupboard and I took a cup, because I'm assuming in the cupboard, clean cups, took the cup, filled it with water, and I looked and there's just dried milk parts floating inside of it. Now some of you are just, you immediately went into Pharisee mode thinking, well, Lori doesn't clean the dishes that well, does she? Shame on you. Shame on you. Could have been one of our kids. Our kids are old enough. They do dishes, and they do a really lousy job at doing dishes, all right? But all I know is I had already took about, drank about half the cup, and I realized, I'm like, I've got old milk floating inside my body right now. <laughs> Even though the outside looked incredibly clean, the inside was filthy. And here's what Jesus is saying, right? He is saying to us that clean hands and clean dishes do not equal clean lives. It's a dangerous thing when your customs have nothing to do with God's commands. It is a dangerous thing when your practices have nothing to do with God's principles. Ladies and gentlemen, there's ritual righteousness and there's relational righteousness. Here's how you know if you're a self-righteous person. You ready for this? Is your desire to look holy or is your desire to long to be holy? You can't have both. Is your, is your desire to make sure that everyone goes, oh, I saw so-and-so at church, not just once on Sunday, they were there twice. Holy column, there they are. They are righteous. Do you hear? They said, they, they prayed five times this week. I was, we were out to dinner with somebody. Pastor, his wife, this is a, this is a pastor of a big church you know what we didn't do before our meal we didn't pray some of you'd be like oh. where in the bible does it say you have to pray before your meals and what does that tell to the person who prepared the food why, why you wonder sometimes why people are like really you gotta pray for before like you think i'm that bad at cook you gotta pray before the food i mean what are we subtly saying to people right but the reality of it is, sometimes we allow our consciences to be offended by things that aren't clearly biblical. No, you cannot. Second hesitation, chapter three, about praying before your meal. It's not there. Think about how easily we're offended, like oh, someone wearing shorts to church, someone wearing a hat. I was a guy, when I first was saved by Christ, I wanted to just upset as many people as I could. Because I just felt they were self-righteous, they were hypocritical. That, but what did I become in the process? My wife knows. This, this is what made her fall in love with me, right? The fact that I would go to Baptist church with no shoes on, and I'd walk right down the center aisle, right in front of everybody, and I'd have, have a bandana on my head, and I'd be wearing a tank top, and how many old Baptist women and old Baptist men were like, oh my gosh, the Antichrist has arrived, right? And there I am just like, front row, right? Was my motivation for being there pure? No. But I had to learn, like, what was I trying to prove? I was, just, I was condemning their self-righteous by being self-righteous myself. Let me just tell you, when you're trying to play the self-righteous game, it doesn't work for anybody. Let me just tell you right now, true righteousness doesn't come in lifeless rituals. It comes through living relationship with God through Christ. True righteousness does not come through lifeless rituals, but can only come through a living relationship with God in Christ. Righteousness is not a thing. Righteousness is a person. And who is our righteousness? Christ Jesus himself. And all God's people said, you know it. I'm at a party a couple weeks ago. And I always love going to parties just like Jesus loves going to meal because I'm always thinking about who I can talk to about Christ. And at this party, I met a Mormon couple who had, they walked away from the Mormon church because they felt like they weren't living up to certain standards. And guess what I get to do? I get to talk about grace. And I found out later through my friend who invited them, yeah, they've been asking questions about the church. And I said, 
don't invite them to church. There's just a bunch of nasty people there. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> a little while later, to another guy, a grace, who comes from no religious background, which is great. And then I'm leaving the party, and the host of the party introduces me to an Indian friend who lives across the street. And guess what we start talking about? Literally, right off the bat, I'm about ready to get in my car, and my friend says, hey, ask this guy the question you asked me the other day. So the Indian man said, what makes Christianity different from all other faiths? I mean, it's almost midnight, man. I got to go home. I got to work on my message for church. I got no time to talk to you about what makes Christianity different. Are you kidding me? Do you think I thought that way? Not at all. I gladly, in the middle of the street at 1130 on a Friday night, shared with this man the difference between works-based righteousness and Christ-based righteousness. And you know what this Indian man did the whole time? He looked me in the eye, and you could just tell, tell the wheels were spinning, and he was like, I understand. I understand. And then this man's father came up, and he started getting into the conversation as well. And right there, 11.45 on a Friday night, we're talking about grace and righteousness that is not self-derived, it is not self-produced, because I'm going to tell you right now, you don't have it. And can I tell you something else? You don't deserve it. But yet, God offers it to you. Woo! Stop. Stop playing the game where you think God is concerned with what you do. Never have a day where you're first not driven by the thought of what does God, who does God think I am? Who am I? Because that's what God's concerned about. He doesn't care what you're going to do that day. Oh God, I'm going to be busy doing this and this and this and aren't you impressed with all this stuff? And God says, I don't care so much about what you do more than I care about who you are. Don't let social media pull you into this lie because all of you have wonderful profiles. All of you put, post sanctified pictures and sanctified this and boy, when it comes to social media, you guys are, and me, we're all the kings and queens of self-righteousness. But while you have that facade, what are you clicking on when no one's looking? What are you thinking in your minds and your hearts? What are you viewing when no one else is there but may I remind you, Hebrews 4, God's there. You might put up a good social media front and look really, really righteous. I mean, you are conservative, you are moral, you are religious, but you're chasing sin with every other click. Come on, really? You're having major engine problems in your car and you think going to the car wash is going to fix it? It is overhaul time, baby. Don't think a quarter oil is going to fix it. God needs to take apart that engine and put it. Will you let him? Will you let him do it in a community of other people who are thinking hopefully the same way? That this is the mechanic's garage? And let me just tell you, it is filthy. It is, has anyone ever been to a mechanic's garage and found it to be so span clean? There's a part of me that I, I hate the thought of grease on my hands, but then there's a part of me that goes, but that's living. They're in there. You can't get it out from under your nails. And I sit there and go, that's awesome. Do you want to take a car to a mechanic's garage where it doesn't look like any work's been done? Or do you want to go to a garage where there are tools and there are parts laying all over the place? But when a car leaves that garage and you hear that hum of that engine, you hear the honk of a horn, ee, ee, you know, whatever. As much as we talk about this being a hospital, the church, it is also the garage of God where he's overhauling our engines in a way that 
<laughs> you have no clue what he's doing. But the final product, you're going to race. You're going to haul. Point number four. Hypocrisy grows in self-absorbed people. And if you're a self-absorbed person, you love no one else but yourself. Look at verse 41. Really kind of mysterious verse. Mysterious verse. (laughs) But give that which is within as charity, and then all things will be clean for you. Anyone have a different translation? What does it say? Carol? So it seems like Jesus is saying, if you give alms, make a donation, be it, contribute, and let me just tell you right now, he's not saying just be a good giver financially to the church and you're going to be good. And there's a lot of people who think that way. The fatter the check, the more righteousness. Is that, is that the, the fatter the check, the closer to the pastor? But in this church, it seems like it's just the opposite. This is the spit zone. You guys realize that, so. It's like SeaWorld. First five rows get wet. Be careful. Here's your tarp. Protect yourself. Give alms, and your whole life will be clean. Here's what Jesus is saying. When God takes over your heart, you're a person that begins to show mercy. Jesus summed up the law like this. Love God, love others. It's not bifurcated. It's not two separate categories. Love for God will equal to love for others, and love for others will equal to love for God. It's a package deal. Self-absorbed people don't love others. And I'm going to tell you, if you don't love others, you don't love God. You can go to church all you want. 1 John How dare you say you love God and yet your brother is in need? How dare you say you love God and you're ignoring what people need around you? This love for people, and especially people in need, is one of the characteristics of someone who truly loves God. The Pharisees only cared for themselves. As a matter of fact, how many times did the Pharisees walk by need? They ignored need. They turned a blind eye to need, right? The fact that they were so judgmental, so prideful, so legalistic, that they would rather cultivate spiritual habits than cultivate spiritual hearts that even recognize need around them. You know what the sign of a clean heart is? Love. You can clang all the symbols you want, but you have no, not love, it is nothing. You can go halfway around the world and serve people in the Middle East, but if you have not love, it is nothing. Romans chapter 12, verse 8, I love this verse. Paul says, the one who exhorts, right? The, uh, that's not even the verse, but it's okay. Because here's the verse. Love is the only debt you owe to one another. Love is the only debt. Love is what sets believers in Christ apart. See, the Pharisees judge Jesus for sitting with sinners. He, they judge Jesus for healing a man, man's withered hand. They judge Jesus for casting out a demon. Rather than celebrating lives that are now free because of God's love, all they could do is criticize. The man left for dead on the side of the road, right? Who was passed up by all these other people, right? They prided themselves that they didn't touch the unclean person, but yet Jesus celebrates the one who stopped and loved. Because I'm gonna tell you right now, you guys, those who have died with Christ have died to themselves. If you have died to Christ, you are no longer a self-absorbed people, but now you're other-absorbed people. You are the type of people that live for the needs and interests of others. Whoever God has put in your path is God's ministry for you. Not the other way around. Here's what God says. Don't be like the rich young ruler who was held captive by his possessions. It's interesting, we call them our possessions, but they really possess us. 
Repent of what has grabbed hold of your heart and resist being owned by anything other than Christ Jesus. Because at the end of the day, God says, show mercy as you've been shown mercy. Show grace as you've been shown grace. And show love like you've been loved. Because it doesn't matter if you have Niagara Falls fall upon your hands, and yet you have not loved, you are still empty before your Creator. Love God. Love others. And leave judgment up to Him. And all God's people said, Woo! Let's stand, let's pray. Father, thanks for this morning. Thanks for investigating, interrogating our hearts. Lord, we hate it when you jump in and you just start taking that engine apart. But yet, what you're able to produce by your grace and by your power, by your wisdom, is something far better than we could ever, ever imagine. Lord, the fact that you have loved us so that we wouldn't go forth and criticize, we wouldn't go forth and judge, we wouldn't go forth in pride, but that you have loved us so that we can go forth and love. Nothing is more important than that. Help us to remember the gospel of Jesus Christ. That he who knew, knew no sin became sin for us so that we may now become the righteousness of God in him let's take that message to others let us love people liberally let us love people extravagantly let's love people graciously thank you god for today direct our steps guide our hearts and may christ be exalted and we pray this in his name amen May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Amen. Love you guys. Have a great day, all right?